Welcome to the stream that we are doing today, and we're talking about a bunch of very, very interesting subjects. Um, and we may go into one. I really, I only have one planned, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. But um, I do want to talk about the, what you see on the bottom. It's actually the only one I have prepared a little graphic for. Uh, so um, we are going to be talking about it. It's a possibility of a new populist alliance in somewhere within the uh, grand scheme of the Democratic uh, Party and, and the left possibly allying with, and this could sound pretty crazy, uh, the populist right on some issues where they may in fact align. And I really do in a long way question this, but there has been a big spat between some of the big prominent lefty commentators on Twitter um, there is kind of a more friendly uh, populist right school of thought. For example, Crystal Ball and Sag Sagar and Jetty. Well, Sagar and Jetty is on the right. He is on what he would definitely consider himself a populist right wing person. And they together host the Hill TV show R Rising, which has, I mean, to, is probably the best thing, but definitely is the best thing that Hill has going on right now. I do watch them uh, quite a bit uh, when they. Uh, post uh they like they kind of post videos i don't know how they really do that show it's a little weird but i've never it's not really done it's not like a live stream it's just like they premiere videos one by one but that's not really the point anyway um yeah they uh her and the commentator crystal ball as a left-wing commentator got into a feud with the um really got into a feud because nathan of nathan robinson editor of current affairs and by the way i got a current i had a my birthday was recent and I got a current affairs um, subscription. Oh, I got to get current a current affairs, current affairs way, subscription. I got a current. I had a, my and birthday was it recent. was very and I got a current affairs. Um, and I still haven't got the thing yet. It's really kind of pissing me off. I still have not gotten that thing yet. And I would like to get my magazine. I I literally I go to the um the mailbox every day to look for it, which is kind of sad, but. I mean, you know, I just, I just gotta get that. I gotta get that current affairs. So yeah, Nathan J. Robinson, he is the founder of uh, Current Affairs, and he is talking about what is gonna be going on with the populist right. So, and I do want to take you through it. We will. He is. I, I mean, I like Nathan Robinson. I do relatively like Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty with Rising, although they do get into kind of some sus areas. Each person, like, it's kind of an interesting show because it kind of compromises everything and nothing at the same time. So they're supposed to go talking both sides of the aisle, but still staying on the, with their beliefs. But a lot of times they do kind of bend on their beliefs, as is natural, I think, when you're with a, when you're really with another human being, like you, if the instinct is to get along, the instinct is not always to disagree, 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 and then it's just really uncomfortable for a lot of people. So, if for example, Crystal, who's a big Bernie supporter, is going to go on a big rant about Bernie Sanders, um, guess what's going to happen? Like, you're going to see a big uh, Sager and Jetty, like, even and really kind of when she says blatantly left wing things, uh, Sager and Jetty is going to just be like, Yeah, well, yeah, I kind of agree, and then when uh, Sagar says some pretty like Christian, questionable things about like Tucker Carlson's like the voice that we need for the future. Like, I mean, she she kind of goes a little bit, maybe a little bit too much than I think that she would normally be inclined to go uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, Tucker Carlson just normally on the on the day to day basis. And I do want to find this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, current affairs. We're going to get into this article in just a minute, uh, but it is very interesting to have this kind of debate. And um, what Nathan Robinson is making, he's been on the show multiple times, and to confront them like this in an, a real article takes a great like. I'm I'm respectful of that because that can, I think that takes like you're gonna, you're being honest, you're being very very honest here. Um, like you have a very um, interesting dynamic so and this is a very very long piece oh I've, i don't know if i could read all this but we'll try and go through it i read it all but actually you know what i think we can do is we can highlight it and this is the best part we can cheat uh for a little bit and then because i do have 
the uh reader th- reader through software because I'm just like I don't know like I'm I know ADHD is super overdiagnosed but I mean my attention span is just in these days these teenage years that I'm in it's already just going down recently deep wrote pop. about a book called The Populist's Guide to 2020 by Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty who co-host the Hills show Rising the book's premise is that today there is a rising kind of left populism and a rising right populism and that these can be described as part of one tendency and share a single idea, namely that American families, workers, and communities which built this country still matter, they deserve a voice, and they are the future. There is a populist movement, they write, as seen in working-class uprisings across the globe, from Donald Trump's election to Bernie Sanders' campaign. Reading the book, I found the idea of left populism and right populism being a unified working-class politics to be deeply troubling. After all, once you get past abstractions like families are the future, what is right populism? Who are the right-wing populists? Well, they tend to be authoritarian nationalists who say the word workers a lot but are actually deeply xenophobic and militaristic. Are Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders part of the same movement? Centrists have often claimed this. Are they right? I don't believe so. I don't think there is a mere policy difference between the right and the left, and I utterly reject Ball and Njeti's thesis that these two groups are aligned. Ball and Njeti responded to me forcefully on their show Rising, with Ball delivering a biting monologue. I'd like to address their criticisms because I think they misunderstand the arguments I am making and that this misunderstanding is quite common when people talk about how the left should engage with the right and what the differences are between left populism and right populism. So I kind of apologize uh, because I wasn't able to kind of like show you the thing that kind of shows you the text and I was trying to get the pop up on the screen, but I do have a little widget on here that allows you to see the text a lot better as it goes by, but that is not unfortunately not showing up. So I didn't want to really... Uh, I was trying to, like, not really paying attention to what the article was saying. I actually, I think, mistakenly, what I did here is I clicked on the wrong article, which was a response to. Okay, so this is a three-part kind of diagram, a three-part narrative that goes back and forth and back and forth. Um, and we could go through a lot of this stuff, but pretty much what happened is, and I guess we can go back to the original article. Um, let's see, isn't right-wing populism just fascism? Uh, so she said, it's a bad idea to right, uh, listen to right-wingers who claim to be on the side of the people. Usually it turns out they want to crush the people by force. Let us ask a question. Who are some famous right-wing populists? Well, let's see. Historically, Hitler and Mussolini can be ca- categorized as right-wing populists. It's true. Today, there's Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, a militaristic sexist homophobe who said if he saw two men kissing in the street, he would beat them. There's Marine Le Pen in France, the most progressive Islamization of our country and the increase... In uh, the progressive, who says the quote, the progressive Islamization of our country and the increase in political religious demands are calling into question the survival of our civilization. There's Gert Wielders in Netherlands. Islam is not a religion, it is not ideology. Uh, it is the ideology of a retarded culture. Uh, plus, Viktor Orban in Hungary and the United States. There's, of course, Donald Trump, whose administration has engaged ceaselessly uh, in ceaseless cruelty toward immigrants who is currently trying to deploy the military against protesters. Like, the, those are the people who kind of be considered right-wing populists. And the most successful way that they appeal to them, it's not like through some, like, deep brand of economic populism and cultural conservatism. It's not. Like, that stuff just does, does not exist. Like, who is doing that? It is through racism and xenophobia and dog whistling and, and really fashion. It's fearing and otherizing people until you are kind of in the... Like, you got a big problem on your hands. It's really what's going on. Like, um, that is, I think, probably the most uh, present, like, the most clear thing that we see uh, throughout this ideology. And I think I do kind of want to put the <laughs> the reader back on now. Uh, I'll try to see, keep up for you guys. But, so let's see. It is very interesting because all of which is to say right-wing populism seems like a terrible ideology that needs to be rejected. Let's start that off. All up. of which is to say, right-wing populism seems like a terrible ideology that needs to be rejected. I disagree with nearly everything these people believe in. And again, this is the big thing. Who are these people? I don't know who these people are that say we have right-wing populism. Um, 
<laughs> what is going on in the chat right now? Oh my, I'm looking at that. What is going on? That just completely distracted me. I don't even know who these people are. Um, actually, I think I know who one of them is, but... Oh, I'm looking at my phone now, and it's hitting me. It's hitting me. I see. Okay. That is like... All right. <laughs> um, yeah, but... You know, we're just going to go right back into this, but... Uh, I disagree with nearly everything these people believe in. They're, they, The kind of world they believe in is not one I wish to inhabit. They're in favor of reactionary cultural traditions, militarized borders, bigotry, and rabid nationalism. I'm a leftist, meaning that I favor the free movement of people and multiculturalism. I'm anti-nationalist and anti-militarist. Donald Trump's ideology seems to me to be monstrous. Monstrous. And, like, again, like, who's the... Like his, Singer and Jenny on his show does not always disagree with Trump. Like that is just it doesn't make any. I don't know. I don't. I don't buy it. So here's the rest of the article. Uh, we can pl- go in a little bit and actually see. It. Not be distracted by oh some of what I'm seeing here. But all right, let's just go. The through. kind of world they believe in is not one I wish to inhabit. They are in favor of reactionary cultural traditions, militarized borders, bigotry, and rabid nationalism. I am a leftist, meaning that I favor free movement of people and multiculturalism. I am anti-nationalist and anti-militarist. Donald Trump's ideology seems to me to be monstrous. I find it peculiar, then, to hear right populism and left populism discussed as part of the same tendency. Usually when this is done, it is by centrists, who subscribe to the horseshoe theory that fascism and socialism have a lot in common. The idea is that the political spectrum, instead of a line, is horseshoe-shaped, meaning that the ends come together. This is what led the Center for American Progress and the American Enterprise Institute, a progressive and free-market think tank respectively, to collaborate on a project about combating authoritarian populism from both the right and left. Their idea is that Donald Trump, Hugo Chavez, Bernie Sanders, Jair Bolsonaro, etc. can all be understood as part of the same tendency. Because they all seek to overthrow elites and the establishment in the name of the people and use the power of the state to create justice. But this idea is fundamentally wrong because it fails to acknowledge the massive difference between the left and the right. Namely that the right's brand of populism is a complete and utter swindle that involves scapegoating foreigners for social problems, while left populism is generally anti-racist and egalitarian. Right-wing populists do not actually care about the people Trump and Bolsonaro might have pitched themselves as crusaders against elites but neither actually cares about helping anyone but their wealthy cronies. Both want to privatize public assets which in practice means simply giving away the people's collective wealth to oligarchs. Both of them have been utterly indifferent to the socially unequal consequences of coronavirus and both are accelerating their country's contributions to the climate crisis which will cause the people incredible suffering. Neither has any interest in deepening democracy, their ideal societies are characterized by massive wealth and equality. They are about as populist as the Nazis were, socialist, meaning that it is a convenient label that makes them sound like something they aren't. I think that like pretty much sums most of it up and pretty much what he's saying is here there is no good version of right wing populism like what is the ideal right wing populism that he's describing and of course what it seems is he sound nice like he seems like most of the things that he says are right are 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 relatively uh pleasant like relatively pleasant on the stream when he's like next to crystal and they don't really get into anything uh but what we do see now is a real interesting like development in tensions because they did respond. And if I could go back here and see if we could play that and uh, look into what he said. And pretty much what he was saying is like, I don't know. I just don't think this is like a good like a people like who are the right wing fascists that we should be are the right wingers that we should be. Um, aligning ourselves with who are the right people that the left as a populist left force the progressive left force I'm not talking about like Nancy Pelosi Hillary Clinton I'm talking about like Bernie Sanders and the left wing of the party should we work with right wing people who are 
good, like who are for for good causes? And I think the answer to that is yes. But what, like, if for example, Mike Lee and Bernie Sanders teaming up to stop like the Iran or, or the uh, droning in Yemen or whatever, and uh, making an anti-militarization bill, like that is perfectly acceptable. That is perfectly acceptable because that's how you just get stuff done. It's not an endorsement of anything they believe in. They sure as hell disagree on a lot, and most of the time. Congress is teaming up across the aisle to make more war. So I think it's a lot better, a lot better that they are not, are are working together. Like that is it's stupid if you don't think so. But like what do we make a campaign with them? Do we unite our like we can be separate but we can be collaborators. Like I really question the extent of how far this should go. I'm sure, I'm like in the examples I cited, like working together past legislation that both parties agree on is perfectly fine. But other than that, I don't see what's good. Like, what's the reason? What should we be doing with people like Sagar and Jetty? Like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. So, I, I, I can't think of one. Um, let's take a look at this. This is the response that they had to Nathan Robinson. Nathan Robinson. All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, friends, and Crystal Ball here is the leftist in this situation. Nathan Robinson of Current Affairs has come for us a full three months after our book came out. He decided to write a review arguing that Sagar and his views are. Yeah, again, which is a little bit whack because like you got you got to I think you're going to like put that out like when you, you got to mean what you say, you know, beyond the pale. And I am complicit in enabling him. Now, honestly, I always wonder how to respond to these things. Do you just ignore it? Do you send down a snippy tweet, which I did, and move on? But I'm sure Nathan's critique is frankly one that is shared by others. So I do think that it is worth addressing. Now, technically, he frames this as a book review, but it obviously also applies to Rising, since the book is primarily a compilation of our 2020 Dem primary commentaries. So here is the crux of the argument that Nathan makes here. He starts by listing all kinds of terrible people who he lumps all into the category of right-wing populism. And that's the thing. Right-wing populism is so poorly defined. Like, you don't even really know who it is. Like, who's, who is the right-wing populist that Sagar and Jetty would point to? And what do they say about some other things? Like, like what does Tom, like, Tom Cotton say about, like, labor rights? What does Tom Cotton say about the war in Iran? I thought we were supposed to be, like demilitarizing ourselves like there is some things that again my position on this is fairly clear if there's a common ground issue that we could work to pass a bill on that is perfectly fine but what else what else are we gonna do with them that works like what is like and are we supposed to like am i gonna go around saying these are good people when we disagree with the one issue and then the other half of the issues they're pro or the other span of issues are pro corporate anti-environment like uh backwards on social issues stuff like that and if you don't agree with them on that then that's fine but i think you can work to with someone to like get something done otherwise like <laughs> what, what's the point like that's just stupid Bolsonaro, Orban, Trump, and then the obligatory Hitler and Mussolini. That's having a quick fake wrong, populist though? Like, like Trump and outright genocidal such a poorly fascist defined like Hitler term. with right-wing populism. He has a groundwork all laid to come to this ultimate conclusion that the left should have absolutely nothing to do with anyone who calls themselves a right populist, as of course Sagar does. So here is the concluding paragraph. The age-old labor question is, which side are you on? Carlson, Jetty, Trump, Bolsonaro, they answer that question emphatically and openly. They are not on our side. They would use the might of the state against us. True. I think I'm, pre I'm fairly sure Jetty was like not against sending in the military on the protesters. I'm, I'm fairly sure about that. I'm fairly sure about that. I'm almost positive about that, to be complete, completely honest with you. Uh, but it is very, very interesting because... Like, it's like, it's like, could you see them? Like, how are they treating union, like, laborers? How are they treating people who protest? Like, it is a very, very uncomfortable situation to me. Like, just talking about that issue. Uh, Right-wing populism. Yes, right-wing populism is simply a lie, and nobody who is on the left should have anything to do with it. And I think it's, I mean, honestly, it's a pretty fair point most of the time. Like, you can work with them on issues where they're willing to come to the aisle and, like, work with you to pass something that you guys can both agree on without giving too much away. Like, within reason, if you both want the same goal, you work together. Because that can, of course, happen sometimes because of the populist element of the the ideologies. But if you're always, like, working together, like, like and you, you just, I think you got to recognize, like, Bernie Sanders 
and Josh Hawley will never share the same goals. Like, they all end up voting for the tax cuts. They all end up doing what they're told in the end, which is give the money up to the rich and screw the workers, to, like, put the boot on unions in every single way that they can. So that is a very, very apparent situation, and I think very, very telling of what's going on. So, all right, I guess we can, uh, oh, that's my Twitch login my Twitch stream. Anyway, let's go back to the video. First, I think it's important to clarify what the mission of the show is since Nathan sort of seems to mischaracterize what we're doing here in the first place. We're not pretending that we agree on everything and joining hands and singing kumbaya. If you've been watching this show, especially in recent weeks, you know Sagar and I have deep, profound, and sometimes tense disagreements on the path forward in this country. I bet you've been having some of those ugly disagreements. Which is with true, your own to be fair. It is true as a so watcher the of the show is, hey, and a fan. Should leftists just wholesale accept right wing populism as an ideology? Of course, the answer is no. But then, literally, no one is arguing that. Instead, the point of the show is pretty simple. There are two major ideologies rising in America right now. What are they? What's fueling them? Where are the intersections? And where are the disagreements? Frankly, during the Democratic primary, those intersections were more on display. There was a shared view of media treatment of anti-establishment candidates and of the supporters that were backing them, of the core rot in America, which has fed populist discontent, of the way that corporate interests stand in the way of pro-worker economic policies like Medicare for All. There was also a close alignment in the coronavirus economic response as both parties completely fell on their face, propping up corporations while leaving small businesses and the working class to wither on the vine. But in recent weeks, the differences have very much been on display. You know we profoundly disagree on the nature of the protests, on structural racism, on policing, on the use of force by law enforcement, and maybe most of all, on deploying the military to quell protests. I won't lie, it has been extremely uncomfortable. It's easy to argue about these things in carefully composed tweets sent into an yeah, audience so of your ideological brethren. It's pauses. harder to engage... S S Sagar, Sagar, whatever, was on the the side of sending the military to gas the protesters peaceful peaceful protesters peaceful like no i don't know about peaceful protesters but i mean overwhelmingly like they're like they're most of the protests were peaceful and i mean the i don't know it's a very very slippery situation i think it's like uh it's it's not good what it is folks is not good that is what i'm telling you thank you so much of course to all the people who are tuning in today and of course we are following the elections uh, we're going to bring you, a, I think we should bring you a little bit of the elections later on in the show today. I think we should definitely do that. Tell you Because things are looking very, very good. We'll tell you about the elections um, later on in the show. But we are going to, I do want to talk more about this because I do have a lot of content planned for this uh, video situation here. Uh, so let's get into it. Age with them in real time, face to face, without the benefit of a straw man. I've grappled these past weeks myself with the tenability of exactly what we're attempting to do. After all, there is a reason why no one else is doing it. It's not easy. But ultimately, once I calm down, I just fundamentally don't believe the left benefits from isolation, deplatforming, and a refusal to engage. In fact, on this show, I've seen quite the opposite. Let's take as an example probably the most fraught issue over the past few weeks, which has been Trump's threat to invoke the Insurrection Act. Now, I do believe such a deployment of the active duty military against protesters would be a terrifying move towards authoritarianism and, yes, towards fascism. I made that case explicitly on the show, and we debated it here fiercely. I wish that was a view that was outside of mainstream acceptability, beyond the pale, so to speak. But we have to acknowledge that it's not. When the president is advocating for military deployment and a sizable chunk of the population is in support of it, I believe engagement is more effective than burying your head in the sand. That's different from saying that every crank or fringe view deserves a hearing, and it can be hard to know where to draw that line. But in general, when a view is held by powerful leaders and a large portion of the country, I believe direct engagement is a more effective strategy than shunning. We've seen the proof of that here. Because we actually have to deal with each other as human beings and can't just caricature and straw man the other side as uniquely evil, we've both heard from quite a number of viewers about being de-radicalized. Viewers who have now placed their anger at the structures, leaders, and institutions which have screwed over ordinary Americans rather than at their fellow Americans themselves. Viewers you who know, have been able to have... Something about this, like something that bad, that kind of framing just doesn't like fit fit right, you know? Like, the, if you just can play that back a little bit. Like, I just, I don't know where to draw that line. 
But in general, when a view is held by powerful leaders and a large portion of the country, I believe direct engagement is a more effective strategy than shunning. I mean, I, I don't really know what, like, Nathan Robinson really had to, like, say, saying in terms of had to do with. I think it's a very, very interesting situation. I do want to actually turn over now to the show system update with another one of the left-wing kind of commentators who's probably more inclined to agree with Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty. Um, updates. The intercepts. Let's check out the system update, the intercepts. Should the populist wor- le- uh, left ever work with the populist right? So let's see what we can go with this. This is system update, and this is going to be a really kind of an interesting debate on the subject, which I think is going to be very, very important to the success of left strategy uh, in terms of dealing with the right as well. And you can see it really wants me to – YouTube really wants me to watch uh, what we're doing elections wrong. Uh, we're doing elections wrong by uh, Hassan Minaj and the Patriot Act, but we're watching Glenn Greenwald for today. System update with Glenn Greenwald. Let's get into it. So we're going to find out where – Welcome to a new edition of System Update. I'm Glenn Greenwald. This episode explores a long-standing debate that once again erupted over the last couple of weeks. It was very weird. He tried to get shamed for like having a slightly younger husband, for whom I have very high regard. It's like about what the proper relationship ought to be between left-wing populists on the one hand and right-wing populists on the other. The debate was initiated when Nathan Robinson, the editor of the left-wing journal Current Affairs, wrote an article harshly critiquing the very popular YouTube program Rising, which is co-hosted by Crystal Ball, a left-wing populist and a former Democratic Party congressional candidate, and Sagar and Jetty, a right-wing populist who previously wrote for The Daily Caller. And Rising is a show that attempts to find common ground and foster dialogue between left-wing populist and right-wing populist, and often succeeds in doing so. And Robinson's argument was that right-wing populism, as it's come to be defined in the United States, is so toxic and so odious that, in the words of his initial article critiquing the show, the left ought to have nothing. Wow, he goes on to for a long time it. here. So and this episode is designed to bring together both Nathan and Crystal separately for me to huh. speak with them to understand better what the contours of this debate are. Right, why, see. more so, finding ways to open channels of communication so that the ability for us to be demonized is eroded and broken down. Obviously, one of the most significant changes in our lifetime is the radical change in how people think about. LGBTs in the 1980s and 1990s, we were spoken of as predators, as pedophiles, as threats to all things decent. And now within a very short time, overwhelming majority support full and complete legal rights, including the right to marry, something that was inconceivable even 10 years ago when almost no Democratic politician supported it. Why did that happen? It's because the demonization campaign broke down because the humanist side of people, the recognition that gay men and gay women weren't these foreign others, but were your neighbors, your teachers, your children, your relatives, your old high school friends, the people who work at the store that you frequent every day, the people that you admire on television and in the arts and culture, that those are gay men and gay women, made it impossible to demonize us any longer, and it changed how people think. And the more people on the left and the more people on the right come together to communicate and to engage in dialogue, not renunciation and recrimination, but discourse designed to find common ground and to better understand where it's impossible, where divergence continues, the more difficult it will be for power centers to keep us divided and to prevent us from ever working together, which ultimately... Yeah, so we're going to probably a little skip ahead a little bit again, but the point he was making there, I don't really necessarily... I mean, he's not going to be probably one of the best in terms of... in terms of, um, uh, like addressing this subject properly but or he, or he, i'm not gonna be one of the best i mean he's he's obviously a gay man himself so he knows but like did could you say that like interaction with the right had anything to do with like the causing of helping gay marriage like did they just talk gay marriage out like i don't know maybe i maybe i have my history wrong it's certainly possible but i do not remember like the right being a very good force like in terms of like yeah we'll talk about it but i think it was really the pro- like the problem was the left just like saying for it pushing for it and just them showing themselves to be who they are was really what brought it through. I don't know if what he was saying was like the, the discourse led to like having a gay, gay in the increase of gay rights. Like maybe I'm misinterpreting or like misstating something here, but I just I just don't think that was it was really through gay like the change like 
gay people, like getting up there in culture, uh, getting more powerful, and really like making themselves known to be like like people too, not as he says predators. Like uh, like the cultural icons that really help gay rights like are huge huge parts of life today. So uh, that's an interesting kind of thing that I don't really know that much about. But I'm trying to see if we can get to the part where he actually introduces. Um, Mr. Nathan Robinson here. Loved hearing Nathan Robinson's voice, though. It's, it was very kind of a, uh, it's very kind of Br- British and Southern. Probably two, it's a wonderful mix of two of the most like pompous accents in the world. But he's like a very charming, nice guy, who dresses in like weird suits that some people make fun of, which is, I think, a little stupid. But here is the conversation. Me too. So. This debate that has taken place over the last, I'd say, 10 days or so between you on the one hand and the host of of the rising YouTube program on the other, Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty, um, has been composed of things like a couple articles from you, a 15-minute segment, video segment from them. And I think there's been a little bit talking back and forth um, past one another, which is why I wanted to do a show about this debate also because I think it's important. Um, And I think, for example, there's been a tendency to kind of characterize your argument as being that people who are left-wing populist or who on the left should never engage with or debate or talk to people on the right. And you've Mm -hmm. emphasized, I think, very accurately that you have a long record of advocating for that kind of engagement of saying left-wing populists ought to debate people mm-hmm. on the right, ought to go on Tucker Carlson show and aggressively denounce the things with which they disagree. So because there's some confusion about what it is that you are saying and what it is yeah. that you're not, why don't you just take a couple of minutes before we were sure. at the start sure. to kind of summarize what you think the debate is, which has gone on longer yeah. before just the last 10 days, um, yes. why you think yeah. it's important, what your position in it is. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been on the show Rising uh, se- several times, and uh, they've been very kind to me. So, uh, uh, but I, they just came out with a book, and the book is called The uh, Populist's Guide to 2020. It was and like I a got few a, months uh, ago, right? Like maybe three months yeah. ago or so? Yeah, a few months ago they came out with a book, and I got a copy of the book, and I picked up the book. And the, the book – so the, th- the thesis of the, of the show is you know, that they have very different politics – but um, the, a discussion is very valuable. Well, the book is a little different. The book goes a little further. And this is where I started to get it kind of disturbed because the book is called The Populist's Guide to 2020, subtitle A New Right and a New Left Are Rising. And it's, and it's blurbed by uh, both Nina Turner and Tucker Carlson, so like a, a wide range of people. <laughs> very um, weird. But the thing that disturbed me about where their sort of co-written shared thesis is, right? They alternate chapters of the book that they write the introduction together, is that they talk about how even there are lots and lots of things that they agree on and that they both believe in a working class politics. They're both anti-elite and first and foremost pro-working class. The current paradigms of politics don't make any sense. And we are presenting what a, they say this over and over, what a real working class politics looks like. And that's the point at which I'm going, well, hang, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, <laughs> because what, what, what politics on the right is an authentic working class politics? Because they talk about how there are left popul- there's a left populism and a right populism, and both are rising together against there are the people against the elites. And the framing is they have some differences. They, you know, Saga is a kind of social conservative, uh, Crystal's to the left, but ultimately, and they mentioned that they mostly focus on in the show just stuff that they agree on. Sometimes they have debates, but mostly they focus on, um, a, you know, an average episode is usually about the way that uh, terrible uh, Democrats have sold out uh, working people's interests, which is true, and it's something that the left and right can can sort of agree on. But at the same time, I, I get keep getting hung up and coming back to this phrase, right wing populism, because. I keep wondering, well, wh- who, who, are, who is the right-wing populist movement? Who are these people? Who is a right-wing populist leader? And the answer, the obvious answer to that, right, is that there is a right-wing populist movement, and it's Donald Trump. Um, in your own country, it's Bolsonaro, right? It's kind of... Uh, I mean, it's a little weird because, like, I don't really see how 
um, conservatism in a in a big way. It's like it's kind of supposedly it's it's built not to be very very structural, right? Like it's not really built built to be like a normal um, thing. It's not it's not nor built to be kind of a, a a a grassroots political party where you'll have people like being built. It's not very it's not very cohesive to a grassroots movement. It's all about like kind of protecting the biggest and most powerful people against. Like also, and of course, there's the minority factor into it. It's like it's not one a movement that lends itself to grassroots. Like, there's very few people in there who are like the the biggest figures in the conservative movement. All have one thing in common. Like they all had their differences about Trump. They had their differences about a whole bunch of different things. Uh, healthcare. They didn't, couldn't even get that done. But the one thing when the chickens came home to roost, the one thing that they were they they knew they had to get past was tax cuts and tax cuts for the rich. That was what they had to do. And I mean, again, there are some times or enough of these right wing populists will go over and they'll be like, eh, maybe you can, you can like work with them on that or something like it. This doesn't like we can, we can make a deal with Bernie Sanders. Like for example, the biggest, like the biggest example I keep coming back to is like Mike Lee and Bernie Sanders on Saudi Arabia and the Senate or something like that. That is a perfectly good, I think outcome and thing to do. So that is something that like that should be encouraged. That kind of stuff should be encouraged. Um, but I would really like to, and I think we could kind of delve into this in the future. Kind of delve into uh, what populist, like what popular, and if we could talk to some kind of a right wing populist, what? Uh, and I do agree that they probably could tend to be a little bit more on the fashion side of it. If I'm if I'm if I'm honest. Uh, but if we could talk to a right-wing populist who thinks that we should make that they should make alliances with the left, like what would it be? Like what shape would it take? That is the question that I cannot figure out, and the mystery I don't think shall be solved in today's session. That's all we have for you today, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you next time on the stream. But the show goes on. It feels like on the podcast.